I think I, we have to, to uh, do it in English, so I will change. So sorry, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, my name is John Aguirre. Uh, I am uh, I am working in Technalia. Uh, I am a coordinator of uh, Penelope Project. This is an European project that uh, brings us the opportunity to to share uh, this hand guiding technology uh, through this uh, web uh, webinar. So I will just introduce uh, some short details about the Penelope. The Penelope is a European project, as I said, it's a quite big European project and is uh, dealing with uh, closed loop digital pipelines. So the introduction of uh, different uh, industry for zero technologies in uh, different uh, industrial uh, pilots. The project is quite big, as I said, nine different countries, 31 uh, partners from universities, research centers, uh, engineering companies and uh, end users. So it's quite uh, difficult to uh, to manage. And uh, okay, uh, in short, Penelope' main goal is to develop uh, digital uh, closed loop uh, technologies. I don't know. Yeah, uh, technologies based on the development. Excuse me. in the development of modular and reconfigurable production approach for the manufacturing of high precision uh, large scale parts. So the project is dealing mainly with technologies, manufacturing technologies for uh, high precision and uh, parts of large scale. Yeah? So different technologies are involved in the project and different sectors are involved in the project. The technologies uh, are around uh, industry for zero technologies. So there are um, digital technologies uh, related with uh, digital twins, uh, product centric uh, data management, reconfigurable production, and these kind of things, but also on the process. So we have uh, zero defect manufacturing uh, technologies related to, to that, and also uh, work centric solutions in the shared workspaces. So here, uh, several robotics technologies are, are used in the different uh, the pilots. Regarding the pilots, uh, we have uh, four big uh, pilots in four different sectors. The first of it is uh, oil and gas. So we have a company producing uh, big uh, um, uh, the pots for, for oil and gas uh, uh, sector. We have also aeronautics, we have a Fokker company, we have a shipbuilding, so uh, here is the uh, technologies applied for, for uh, automating uh, different shipbuilding uh, operations. And we have also both bus and coach, so here we have a company producing buses, and we have also different technologies, uh, uh, robotics technologies and others, in order to make it uh, easier for them to, to assemble the, the buses. So uh, this is a very short uh, introduction to the Penelope uh, project and then we will con uh, continue, we will start with uh, the main uh, topic of this uh, webinar regarding the hand guiding technology. So I will pass uh, the control to my colleague uh, John Onyativia. So hello everyone. Um, I am John Oñatibia, a colleague of John Aguirre and Naito Ribarguren at Tecnalia. And we are going to deep dive in one of the technologies that uh, is worked in uh, the Penelope project. So the webinar, we're going to present the webinar between Aitor and me. I'm going to give a brief overview of the robotics market and the why uh, why is of, the, of using this technology in robotics uh, to give a bit of a context and then Aitor will present the, the technical part of, of this technology. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, John, maybe stop sharing yours because I think it doesn't let me share here. No. Okay, 
Yeah, so this is the hand guiding technology introduction and, and applications. And as I mentioned, uh, we're going to to give a, a brief overview of the robotics market and why we we are working on on this technology. Uh, we three are from the production means and robotics department in Technalia, and so I'm I'm gonna start with a brief overview of what Technalia is. Maybe you all know it, but it's always good to 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 give some some details. So Technalia is the largest private uh, research center in Spain. Uh, it's a non-for-profit organization and we are members of the Basque Research and Technology Alliance. We are more than 1,500 people with a quite good balance between uh, a gender balance. Uh, and our annual income in 2023 was uh, of 137 million and our goal is to try to have a good balance between income that comes from companies and from the public sector so we collaborate with companies to do r d oriented to to what they need and we try to develop technology in uh, publicly funded projects to develop all these technologies that might be useful for, for the company. So our main mission is to, to generate this technology transfer for the benefit of, of the companies that collaborate with us. Uh, we are mainly based in the Basque Country, uh, where our different research centers are located, but we also have uh, branches in Madrid and Zaragoza, in Spain uh, and some branches abroad uh, at the international level, uh, special focus in, in France where our offices are, are growing due to also the, the activity in this country uh, due to the proximity we have. And our main goal, as I was mentioning, is to transfer technology to companies. So we like to say that we are filling the gap between the basic research that is performed at universities and the R&D needs of the companies. We live in a region where there are a lot of SMEs, uh, very small companies that maybe don't have the R&D capacities of very large corporations. So we collaborate a lot with these type of companies to, to be like their R&D department uh, in a wide range of, of topics. And we also collaborate with, with large companies to explore maybe technologies that they are not familiar with. And so we, we try to, to answer to these R&D needs of, of the different sectors. And our scopes are aligned with the sustainable and development goals. And we, we work on a uh, wide range of, of topics that you can see here, energy transition, digital transformation, urban ecosystem. And we are uh, mainly in the smart manufacturing uh, field. And well, compared to other European research centers, we are quite well located uh in terms of success rate and volume of projects that we we handle and uh, well uh we'll we'll go we'll dive now in the in the robotics topic that is the 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 subject of today's webinar uh to give you a bit of a of an introduction to where does this hand guiding technology come from and why why is it needed uh, when we talk about robotics in the manufacturing uh, sector uh, to a lot of people come come to their mind uh, car factories like the one that we can we can see now uh, this is a, a factory from from spain in barcelona uh, of seat and they have more than a thousand robots working uh, synchronized and uh, producing car bodies. I think it's one every 60 seconds. 
And when you see videos like this, uh, you think that robotics technology has already developed all the functionalities that are required by the manufacturing sector. And you would think that it's a, a mature technology, right? But the reality is that when you go to most of the manufacturing companies that we have in our environment, what you see is a lot of manual work with uh, people uh, working in difficult tasks that can be dangerous. Uh, so we can see that robotics hasn't reached yet all the different fields of the manufacturing industry that, that would benefit from, from this technology, right? We, in robotics, we, we like to say that we want to apply robots uh, in the uh, to solve the three Ds, right? The dangerous, dull, and dirty tasks, and this is a bit uh, the the guidelines that that we follow. Uh, what we see in robotics as well is that even in very big projects where robotization has been tried, uh, it's not always successful. And here we have an example of two very large actors uh, of uh, robotics and uh, manufacturing sector of uh, aeronautics, so Boeing with KUKA, that tried to automate some riveting tasks for the manufacturing of the Boeing 777 in 2014. And in 2019, they had to stop because robots were not flexible enough. They weren't able to address all the little variabilities that uh, they face between one task and another and they had a lot of stops they needed a lot of human intervention to recover from from these stops and in the end they cancelled this automatization and they went back to the traditional way of doing this uh, uh, which is by doing it by hand so there is still a lot of room for improvement and now this is a bit the, the the technologies where where we work on and in robotics in artificial intelligence uh, there's a, a paradox uh, that was formulated by moravec that says that it's uh, very easy to make a computer or a digital system uh, exhibit some intelligence behavior in terms of decision making but it's very very difficult to mimic uh, one-year-old uh, psychomotricity with with these systems, right? And this is a quite old statement from the late 80s, but it's still true. Uh, there are there have been a lot of uh, advancements and progress in terms of uh, the technologies that are involved in robotics, but we still see that there's a lot of room for improvement, right? And this is another example uh, that uh, was very famous some, some years ago in the robotics field, the uh, Kamprad test. Kamprad uh, is a creator the, of IKEA, Ingvar Kamprad. And there was a challenge that was launched, uh, which was uh, making some robots uh, assemble a simple IKEA chair. This is a task that for a human being is very simple. Well, in theory, not for everybody, but following some very simple instructions, uh, uh, a person can very easily assemble this uh, type of furniture. And this task that seems trivial for humans, it's very difficult for the robots because they have to manage a lot of uncertainty. Uh, they lack the sensitivity and the perception that humans have and the dexterity that is required to perform some little tasks, right? So this is a bit the, the context where we, we move where, where we are and where we try to develop some technologies to, to facilitate uh, the adoption of robots in the manufacturing industry. To give you also some, some context, uh, some numbers about the robotics market at the international level, 
what we're seeing lately is that well the robot adoption uh, in the manufacturing industry it's, is growing and growing. Uh, the robots density uh, in the uh, industrialized countries has doubled in the past five years. Uh, special mention to China, uh, instead of doubling, they have multiplied by five. So this is a plot where we see the robots density, but in absolute numbers, you can imagine that China is uh, already number one. If you multiply by the, the population they have. Uh, and this trend is un unstoppable. What we we see is uh, some forecasts of 31% uh, growth uh, in the following seven years, for example. So this is something that uh as i was mentioning is in, is unstoppable and we have to be there to develop the technologies that uh, make sense to to help uh industries to adopt these these functionalities right and this is in the manufacturing context what what we are seeing in the last years as a flexible manufacturing and it's moving from the mass production models to personalized uh, production or high viability productions where uh, the manufacturing companies have to adapt their production constantly constantly even if they are uh, producing one good, this good uh, now is very personalizable and this is a very huge uh, stress for, for these companies. Uh, for example, in the car uh, industry where we see, uh, where we would think that this is not a problem because they have a very uh, low mix and very high volumes uh, they have uh, with the, all the configurations that we can have in different cars uh, we have the mo uh, an example of uh, a3 model that with all the different configurations that uh, uh, consumer can select you have more than 1000 uh, combinations uh yes uh, we have forgotten to mention that uh if someone has any question uh use the chat because i think that you cannot talk directly so write your questions on the chat and and we will answer them and yeah, so well, the technologies that we work on is these uh, high mix low volume uh situation where we want to move from these mass production uh models to uh flexible and adaptable production cells where robots and machines can adapt and reconfigure to uh, address the the stresses of these uh production model changes uh but as I was mentioning, uh, there's still a lot of room for improvement and there are a lot of sectors where robots haven't been adopted yet. And these are some of the barriers that have been identified. So uh, in SMEs where they have a know-how and a way of producing the, the, the goods that they produce, there's sometimes uh, difficulties to to automate things sometimes because the task itself is very complicated but sometimes also because of the mindset of the the people working on on this type of companies right and we have to address these challenges to try to to change things and try to make things easier for for non-expert operators by by training them or developing the technologies that would allow them to use robots in a more natural way and this hand guiding uh, technology is something that can that can help them and what we are seeing also is that the the moment is is now for for this change because we are seeing a lot of uh, technological advancements that will make 
robots more flexible and adaptable and they will be able to to address all these challenges uh, all the advances that we are seeing in artificial intelligence computer vision uh, computational power is becoming cheaper and cheaper with the uh, revolution of the gpus and we are also seeing uh, a lot of improvement in connectivity now we have wireless connection and connectivity almost anywhere in 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 the the factories thanks to 5g and uh, uh, late wi-fi uh, standards so all these technological advancements make us think that uh, things will will change a lot in the in the robotics field so I will let now continue to Aitor to give you a deep dive on the hand guiding technology. And, and that's all from my part. So, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, I will continue with, with the presentation and going to the main topic, the, the hand guiding. Here, the idea, we will talk a bit uh, about the motivation, why we are using it, because uh, John mentioned a lot of uh, topics and a lot of uh, interesting points of how we can make robotics more flexible and more adaptable. And hand guiding is a, a nice tool for this, so we will give some information about why we're using it, which, which is the theoretical uh, uh, motivation for this. So, uh, I will give you some some small tips of information of which robot offer it, how we can implement it, and which is the context nowadays, and how, what we can find in, in the market. Afterwards, uh, we will see some alternatives and how we are using it. Uh, maybe most of us, we are thinking about hand guiding as a straightforward way of moving robots and a bit linked for a simple teaching of, of trajectories. Uh, we have implemented here in, in Technalia. We have been using it in the traditional way, let's say. But uh, once we have this technology, we figure out or we saw that it's possible to use it not in the traditional scenarios, but uh, it's a good way for us also to to program, to teach things, to get some information from the application. So not only think on hand guiding as a way of moving robots for non-expert user, that it's initially is the main idea and motivation, but we are finding out some different ways of using it and in, indeed in our daily lives. And uh, for, let's say, expert users, it's, only a, it's also a very nice tool to teach a new application, reconfigure things, get uh, geometrical data about our, our application. So we'll try to, to provide this this view on hand guiding, not only as a simple tool of moving robots, that's it's the initial idea, but how we are implementing. We will show some, some examples of past and projects that we are currently developing where we have as a side uh, tool we are introducing it just to uh, give you a brief overview of how we can use it in in our applications so uh, going to to the motivations uh, as john mentioned uh, industry requires right nowadays complex and flexible applications this idea of all the idea of uh, mass productions and that we are programming a robot and this program will be executed within years and years without any modification and as it is now it's not a reality the industry uh, one of the big topics in the last decade has been this customization and this goes completely against to this mass, traditional mass production. So the main requirements for these new flexible and complex applications, some of the big, uh, big topics that we are finding and 
that uh, industry and companies around us are repeating over and over again are this high mix and low volume, uh, volume scenario. Nowadays, they know that even if they are thinking on a product that will be produced for the next two years, they are aware that possibly there will be some changes from the market, from their providers or whichever, that will possibly in the next few months, they will require to change things in their applications. So this is the scenario is, is a reality and it's a big barrier of on the application of, of robotics. Also, one idea that's more a bit general and a, a wish, let's say, but is that the robot should be able to adapt to the environment. From many aspects, the traditional one is to, for example, introduce uh, cameras to detect where the parts are coming to avoid uh, building expensive uh, setups for the robot, but also with this uh, new collaborative uh, robotics paradigm. It's also known that we need to adapt to see what's happening if there are operators near the robot and the robot uh, in the best case should be able to adapt not only to the parts and the, to the task that uh, the robot is performing, but also to what's happening, possible operators around and on the changes on the environment. And the one big topic that maybe initially the hand guiding is falling is this easy to program and reprogram robots and applications. So uh, we know that uh, taking into account this high mix, low volume scenario, we will need to, to adapt programs, uh, applications uh, and so on. The, um, all the companies uh, right now, some company or some integrator from outside my company will come here, will make all the cell, will design everything and will put me in the program and I with a simple interface. But if I need any modification, some experts from this company will need to come here, make all the modific modifications, this is cost, this is time. So I would like some way of programming and reprogramming robots and in an as simple way as possible because uh, people in my company will be expert on using robots but not programming them. So this last topic is one of the trigger, uh, the topic that triggers this uh, hand guiding requirement or necessity. One thing that uh, is a side effect of all this uh, complex and adaptive robotics is that uh, it's difficult to, to adapt to this flexible robotics paradigm because a complex application usually requires a, a deep knowledge and high level of knowledge of multiple technical topics. In traditional robotics of mass production, maybe it was possible that non uh, really, really expert uh, worker or operator could record a uh, uh, some points in with the robot in a simple way made a quite simple program and it could be valid even if it was not uh, maybe optimized for the setup or so on but he was able to do so. Now this flexible robotics requires as John mentioned before the inclusion of a, a lot of topics and a lot of technologies. One of the traditional technologies is the artificial vision, the capability to introduce a lot of types and variety of uh, of cameras in the environment to detect both the parts, uh, things that are uh, happening around the robot, and it's not only about detecting it; on it's only it's also a way of using this robot, uh, this information to to manage the robot. So even if we are able to detect, we need to put this input in the robot. So if we want to make very dynamic and very adaptive uh, programs, we will need also to link this vision information with the robot control, the low level control, and use this information to modify the theoretical uh, movements of, of the robot in, in real time in a very, very, very fast uh, way. So it, uh, it's becoming a, a control problem. So this is a very, another research topic. 
Also, we we need to work on trajectory generations and traditional robotics. We record some points, we execute the program, and we see that everything is working. So there's no need for for further uh, calculus or further uh, information management. Nowadays, especially if we introduce artificial vision, for example, detecting parts or detecting things, we'll need to render generate in real time robot trajectories and and execute them. But we'll need to to put some some more mechanisms because it's not uh, very safe to just um, calculate trajectories and send. We'll need to to check if there are collisions with the environment. Uh, check if the created trajectory are, trajectories are optimal. In the case of parts that have symmetries, uh, check the different uh, possibilities and verify which of the trajectories is the best one for for the robot to, to avoid unnecessary movements and ab avoid problems like uh, configuration change. And one of the hot topics in the last decade has been also the force control. Especially if we are thinking on assembly of that, how humans uh, do the assembly of different parts on different things, we are not using only the vision feedback to do so. We are using our force, uh, the feedback of if we are attaching to parts, how we are uh, inserting parts, how we are making some rotations. We we are using more this force feedback uh, of the operation than the vision one. Initially, we used the vision to make some high level, let's say, thinking of what we should do. But afterwards, we are relying completely on, on force. So force control has become an, a hot uh, research and implementation topic. And this is uh, one of the topics where the hand guiding is, is based. So you have seen that we have talked about artificial vision, robot control, trajectory generation, force control. These are just four topics. There are for sure more. And each of one of these topics is a research, uh, wide research topic in itself. So we have to mix a lot of technologies with a lot of knowledge. And we know that operators are not expert in robotics. Um, for sure, not in this very specific and high level topics. So we need somehow to offer mechanisms to simplify this robot programming, especially not thinking on the traditional robotics where more or less things are quite simple and doable for by non-expert uh, users. But especially if we are thinking on how we mix this flexible robotics and operators, we need to offer for sure mechanisms to simplify this, this robot programming. So the hand guiding became quite popular, especially if I'm correct, 12, uh, 13 years ago, uh, Universal Robot, a Danish uh, robot company appeared. And uh, even if this concept of uh, collaborative robotics was uh, known by the, uh, by the robotics community, they brought it uh, to the market and it became a really, really hot and trendy topic in, in robotics. The idea is simple. We will put robots that are able to work side by side for you humans. In this initial idea, and the, the main topic is that robots should be safe to work with humans. But uh, this universal robot in the their UR robots they provided some additional tools that were not uh, intrinsically related with safety and collaborative, but uh, they added some tool for an intuitive way to move robots that is uh, hand guiding. The idea is that, well, even if the teach pendants and the way of presenting information is becoming easier and now the teach pendants are nicer and easier to understand, even though for some operators it's still a bit confusing to use them. So why not uh, offer a new and intuitive way of moving robots, just taking with our hand and moving it. It's a very intuitive way of doing and people like a lot uh, this, this feeling of taking a robot and taking the control. So the basic idea here is to make use in this kind of robots of the force torque or motor current information 
and from this information estimate the force that the operator or the user is applying and use it to, to move the robot. The idea is very simple and became very, very popular with the expansion and the appearance of this collaborative robotics. And as I said before, an important thing, at least for me, is that even if the main idea of the collaborative robotics is the safety between human and, and robots, uh, the addition of this tool has become more or less an, an standard nowadays in the market. So I would say that almost all the collaborative robots offer some way of hand guiding. Uh, more sophisticated, easier to use, uh, softer or not, but uh, it became a standard in, in these collaborative robots. So now I will give you some, some bits of information of the different approaches, different robots available, linking a bit with uh, the different options that we have nowadays of, uh, in the market for the hand guiding. Uh, we have three main approaches. Uh, the first one that uh, appeared was the collaborative robots, but without any force or torque sensor for doing this hand guiding. So the first generation of dual robots, uh, universal robots, that you can, can, can see in the top of, of the pictures. Uh, in this case, the universal robots uh, do not have any force or torque sensor in, in the robot itself they are able to estimate the force that we are applying measuring the motor current uh, for this estimation let's say that uh, knowing how the robot is we have they made some measurements in theoretical measurements of which should be in each position the the motor current that we should uh, that the robot should be applying and taking it as a as a baseline they are able to estimate uh, in a quite accurate way, which forces and applying in in each of the uh, of the joints of the robot, they mixing all this information. We are able to estimate not in a very very precise way, but in a in a nice way the force that an operator is applying on on the robot. And this way, in this uh, first generation robots of collaborative robots, the operator applying the force in in the tip of the robot, he is able to, to move the robot. Uh, in the second, uh, going to the second step, to the second bullet point, the new generation of the UR robots uh, decided that it was a, also a good idea and a com complementary way of measuring to adapt, in this case, a forced uh, sensor. And we have other other robots uh, like the Kukaiva, where they uh, put some torque sensor in each of the joints, and some similar approaches can also be found on the Fanuc CRX family. So, here the idea is that, well, we will try to measure the forces in a more precise way, and we will add some force torque sensors on, on the robot. The idea or the main advantage here is that we are able to use directly the, the measurements of, of the sensor, which in practical is much more accurate than the estimating the forces uh, through the currents. This uh, first approach is valid and it's working, but with this second uh, approach, we are able to get uh, finer information and the hand guiding is uh, let's say it's softer and it's uh, more reactive to, to our forces so finally the end user experience is far better so we have these two approaches in the collaborative robots that more or less as i said before it's a uh, something that you will find in almost all the uh, collaborative robots but it's also interesting uh, to apply this to, to industrial robots. Uh, as, as we know in many factories and the, the almost all the robots are industrial big uh, robots. And right now, even if they are not collaborative, or you can make them, but it's uh, hard, hard work. It's also interesting to, to add this paradigm of hand guidance for to these uh, robots. In this case, for example, Fanuc has some 
some devices to, to carry out this uh, hand guiding. And if we want to apply this uh, paradigm of hand guiding in industrial robots, we need to rely on an ex external force torque sensor to do so. So the idea here, as you see in the picture, we can attach some device in in the flange or in the tool of the robot. Uh, it will include for sure some force torque sensor. Um, as we are moving it, uh, applying forces directly to the force torque sensor, we are able to, to move. So in this case, it's not a building functionality. We need to add some external uh, device like uh, external force torque sensor, but it's, a, it's also a, a valid option in the case that we want to make, uh, to apply this hand guiding to, to standard robots. In this case also, I want to highlight some pros and cons. Everything is not the same. We need to put uh, some bullets and make clear that everything is not uh, the same in this case from technological and, and integration point of view. In the first case of the collaborative robots with a force talk sensor, this first generation of uh, UR robots, it's a building solution. It's uh, off the shelf. You buy the robot, you take it, mount it, and the functionality is there. No need to any any development or, or anything similar. But uh, as I mentioned before, the force is estimated through the current, so uh, it's not so easy to guide. In some configurations, you need to apply the large amount of force, so sometimes the experience of guiding is not uh, so, so good. Especially if we are making movements to guide the robot from one side to the other right area of the workspace, it's easy to do so. But when we are trying to to put it precisely on the part, on we want to make some very precise operation, like let's say uh, screwing or something like this. If we want to put it precisely in some and move just uh, a bit, some bit of millimeters, it's not so easy to to do with this approach. In the second case, with the collaborative robots with force torque sensor, as I said, we have the this direct. Um, information of the of the sensor and the way of moving it is uh, finer and it's easier to guide it to, to in very precisely so it's a building solution you have a fine guiding so it's a very very nice um, uh, way of, of programming put it in precisely in in our uh, desired points in the application so Mainly, let's say that we don't have any any cons in, in this approach. And finally, we have this uh, third way of introducing hand guidance in the um, industrial robots, usually integrating some kind of force torque sensor. So usually the, the guiding is quite fine because we have direct uh, information from the sensor. The sensor information, if the sensor is good for sure, is uh, is good. So the, the feeling of, of guiding it is, is nice, but uh, we need to acquire these sensors. In the case of ANUC, it's a product, so we can integrate easily, but if not, uh, the integration of the external sensor could be a bit tricky. Uh, to do it in a fine way, we need to have access to the low level control of the robot and in some cases as uh, some of us know it's not an easy way to have access to this low level control with high frequencies so if we in the case of fanu they have this product so it's uh, easy and nice to to use it but if we want to make it by ourselves it can be a, a tricky thing so uh, I will I don't want to bore you just some bit of technical principles of uh, what's happening during this hand guiding. So some everything is relying on this force uh, force torque uh, control of, of the robot uh, as, a, as a robotics topic, let's say. And usually, and the most common thing is that hand guiding implements uh, some kind of admittance controller there. So the idea is that we want to provide to the robots and the, the behavior of a spring damper system. 
so where we can, can push. If we are thinking on a traditional spring, let's say we are pushing, we are able to deform the or move the, the spring or the robot, let's say, and when we release the robot, the, ro uh, the robot will come back to the initial position. Here, if we technically put this stiffness value to zero, uh, the system won't come back to the uh, origi original position. So the idea here is to use this spring damper uh, behavior, but with a stiffness value of, of zero. Uh, here, the main idea is that the robot will receive or estimate the force uh, information. And something that is very important and just to keep in mind, the robot or the system in order to, to mimic this uh, spring damper behavior needs to uh, get the information of the external force uh, that we are applying. Thinking on a robot where we have this force torque sensor, uh, all the robots for sure we will put some kind of tool or device in on the tip of the robot. That's for our application, and this tool will have some mass. So the tool by itself, uh, we will apply some force to the robot. So we need to subtract somehow this force exerted by the robot tool, gripper, camera, so whichever we have in in the robot and use this external force information afterwards to, to feed the spring damper uh, system. So it's very important here to have a, to calculate accurately the gripper's mass and center of gravity, because this is the way of extracting, subtracting the, the force exerted by the gripper and get only the external force applied by the operator. So these, uh, the principles are, are classical and for many engineers, you know, this spring damper uh, system. But here, uh, the main issue in the application of the robotics is on one hand to have a nice estimation of the forces, the total forces, and afterwards, a way of having a very accurate uh, grip or mass and center of gravity in order to subtract this force. In reality, at the end of the day, as everything is not precise enough, even if we are not touching the robot, we will have some small or tiny forces uh, that we will sense. So here is how we can minimize this, uh, this noise in order to avoid to have the, uh, the robot floating ar around the user. So that's why usually we have some thresholds to at least apply some force before start moving the robot and so on. So, but uh, I, won't, I won't bore you more with these technical issues, but something that's very important that you, you should keep in mind that it's a very nice thing of guiding the, the robot with the arm and so on. But in this process, uh, we will need to calculate and to calibrate the system in order to get the gripper's mass and center of gravity. Usually, these robots have some calibration uh, tools that the robot will move around and will give you some estimation about the gripper's mass and center of gravity. So we have some tools in the robots to do so but it's very important. And that's why sometimes we need to, to apply more force than the desired because we, we need to apply these safety thresholds. Now, also additionally, uh, we have talked about that this hand guiding became quite popular with the apparition of these collaborative robots. And as we are talking about collaborative robots, uh, everything should be around also safety because in this case, uh, we will be side by side with the robot when we are doing hand guiding. So in the case of collaborative robots, the safety is somehow guaranteed by, by the robot itself. But if we are thinking on, on big industrial robot and applying hand guidance on, on these robots, we are talking about big robots, huge robots that are not safe, nor by design or by the concept of the robot and we will need to be uh, side by side of these huge robots. So in these cases, the safety is necessary and very important indeed. So uh, all the, these approaches, uh, spe especially those uh, available in the market, 
it's necessary to, to include some mechanisms to ensure that the hand guiding is executed in a safe way. So usually uh, all these robots or devices include some kind of, of button in, in the robot itself or in the effector or in the case of the URs in the teach pendant that uh, the operator should uh, push in order to enable the hand guidance. In case that something strange happened, uh, the operator will release it and we will stop the, the hand guidance. So you can see in the pictures different options. It's usually about putting some buttons, usually also some kind of lights and so on to, to provide some additional feedback that we are in the hand guidance mode. So uh, it is very, very important to provide this because we need to make it this hand guidance, but uh, we need to do it in a safe way because we will be side by side with, with the robot. And as I said before, for, uh, or both uh, robot uh, manufacturers and also the, in this, uh, in our case, Technalia as a developer of uh, further technologies around, around it, we tend to add additional mechanisms to, to ensure that when we want operators want to activate um, this uh, hand guidance, he's do it consciously and we verify it uh, a lot of time twice to make sure that he's uh, activating it consciously and we do want to avoid any any danger uh, the, uh, caused by any undesired activation. And uh, we'll see afterwards, uh, we are talking a lot of time of this hand guidance of the idea or taking the robot with, with the hand and moving. But in some cases we found in different projects that hand guiding, um, the tra this traditional hand guiding is not viable in, in some of the environments. Uh, we will see afterwards uh, some projects where we applied it, but for example, in Sherlock project, we had uh, a dual alarm mobile manipulator and we should uh, take some parts on, on some shelves and in my case I'm not uh, very tall indeed and I'm not able to grasp or move the robot to the highest uh, levels of, of the shelves. So there are some inaccessible spaces, there are also some narrow spaces where it's difficult to enter the robot and also yourself to, to guide it and there are also some, there can be some hazardous uh, environments where it's not safe or not desirable to put operators there to make this uh, hand guidance. And also there are some ergonomic setups where maybe to do the guiding, the hand guiding, we should be leaned or in some not ergonomic uh, position. So in some cases, this hand guidance is not viable. So. We found out that we can mix this traditional hand guiding with some traditional or more traditional teleoperation options. We are using, you will see afterwards, two main approaches. On one hand, the more traditional and very usually related with medical robotics, that is the use of haptic devices. But uh, in this uh, Sherlock project where we have a mobile platform, we will be moving around the shop floor and it's not uh, viable to have these uh, big haptic devices. We are using also, and it's quite popular uh, <laughs> nowadays in, in the lab, to use this wireless 16 mouse. These mouses are traditionally used for CAD programming and CAD design. And we found out that you are portable, easy to, to put uh, around the robot and it's very convenient for, for also to, to, leper, to leverage them. So these are different options, are not uh, usually built in in the robots. So uh, it's another alternative to the hand guidance, but requires implementing them in our, them in our applications. And usually to have a nice feeling of teleoperation, we need to have access to the low level of the road controls. It's not a big issue in the collaborative robots because they are quite open, let's say, but it can be tricky in the traditional industrial robots. So uh, when talking about the applications, so sorry. 
talking about the, the applications, uh, this hand guidance has been tightly related uh, usually to the um, to the teaching. So the idea of, okay, a non-expert uh, operator can take with the hand the robot, move to the desired positions and walk um, using this information or this uh, way of moving it to, to make some kind of, of teaching. Uh, many manufac robot manufacturers offer some mechanisms to move the robot, okay, let's say with the hand guidance and afterwards record points in a discrete way. So the idea is that I will start my application, I will take the hand guidance, I will move to the initial positions, I will apply, uh, I will push some button in the teach pendant, I will record the point, I will move afterwards to the grasping position, I will record the point, so I will make it in a discrete way and there are some built-in solutions for this. Maybe it's not the most comfortable thing, and but it's a it's a solved thing and some tool that we have. But uh, in Technalia, thinking on the different applications of that we have been using in in our different projects, this approach uh, a bit is quite limited in in some cases, uh, especially when we are trying to teach uh, complex applications or we will see afterwards some of the uh, of the points here. So for us, uh, the, the initial idea was to why not enhance this uh, continuous uh, this, uh, information or traditional teaching by enhancing it and having getting continuous data position of the robot in a streaming and afterwards try to use this continuous in, uh, information to generate more complex trajectory or fit or use this information to do something more more complex or more tricky. So this is the, some concept that we have been working on. So the idea is to enhance, uh, we have applied uh, initially, you will see in some projects, in, especially in the Kukaiwas, but we are extending it to, to other collaborative robots like the UR. So the, here the idea is to make, let's say, a continuous teaching where we will get a lot of data instead of just recording some three, four, five points, we will be recording uh, robot data continuously. This is a nice thing, we will have a lot of information, but uh, it also makes things, let's say, more complex because we will have a lot of information and we will need to analyze this information, uh, filter this information in order to, to apply afterwards all this data in, in our flexible applications. So in our concept, uh, you can see the schema on, on the right side. So on the top, we have the, in our case, the Kukaiwa, but we are applying also with the operation, especially in, in the UR robots. So we have uh, the direct communication with, with the robot. We will uh, be uh, acquiring a lot of uh, information and in our PC we will have four main blocks. We will have this what we call initially it was the EVA state recorder but now it's the robot state recorder. The main idea is that here we will get uh, right now in order to avoid having too much information we are recording robot data at 10 hours. So we are recording continuously data and storing it in, in the database. Here, just to have a rough idea of what's happening, we are doing some kind of teaching of not even very complex uh, trajectory and so on. We are recording more or less at 10 hertz. We initially start to think of 25 hertz and something more um, higher frequencies, but with even with 10, 10 hertz, we are finally having a trajectory with 200 or 300 points. Uh, during the teaching, you are a lot of time stopped, pushing buttons, making something. So we ha you have a lot of repeated information. So that's why we decided to to lower this rate because uh, we we with experience we find out that with something like 10 hertz for almost all the application is is enough. So the idea is that this this uh, module will have direct communication with the robot and will uh, get all the data. And all this data is uh, recorded and loaded in, in a database. The idea here 
we store a lot of information for the lobo, uh, robot trajectories. Indeed, the, the main ones are the joint position, but we are very interested in the Cartesian positions. The idea is that here we can make the teaching with a tool. Afterwards, we can maybe change the tool for because application has evolved and we want to have these Cartesian positions and as we will provide a more meaningful information of what's happening in, during the teaching. And additionally, we also record some uh, specific information about which are the grasping or release points, we are, which are the starting of compliance behavior. We are adding some additional tags to these points that could be interesting afterwards with the, for the execution of different kinds of, of applications. And as I said before, uh, here we are storing a lot of data. So it's nice because we have a lot of information of what's happened during the teaching. But uh, something that is not as nice is that we have a lot of, mm, not noisy, but too much data for in some cases. So we need to, to provide or to develop. We develop different, uh, in this Cartesian trajectory analyzer, different filters, different functionalities in order to provide all this raw data of, of the teaching and get uh, some some information that is meaningful afterwards for, for the execution. For example, when we are making, just an, as an example, uh, a teaching of a, a complex trajectory or, or long trajectory where we initially go to a grasping position, we grasp it, and afterwards we move, avoiding some collisions with the environment, and afterwards we go to the release point. We are recording a lot of data. So in these filters, we are able initially to divide the trajectory in different segments. So from the initial positions to the grasping one, from the grasping, avoiding the collision to the release one, we are dividing because for us will be, there will be different trajectories and segments. We can filter also by distance or by time because uh, during the teaching, we saw that a lot of times you get stuck or you are start thinking on another thing or start interacting with with the user interface and you spend a lot of time in some given positions. So we saw that there's a lot of redundant and unnecessary and noisy data there. So we de developed some different uh, filters, mainly related with the Cartesian calculus of, of these trajectories of Cartesian information, some way of filtering it, and provide afterwards ready for the, the execution of the, of the trajectories. And finally, our last piece in, in that, in that uh, schema is the user interface. Okay, we have a lot of functionalities. The what's done inside is quite advanced uh, or complex, but we want to offer a very simple and intuitive way of interacting with it. So here the idea is to develop, in our case, a web interface to, to guide the teaching and guide the, all the operation in an intuitive way to for operators and are not used to to use uh, this complex or teach pendants and so on. So the idea is to offer the web browser that we usually execute or visualize in, in a tablet. So all of us are very used to use uh, smartphones or tablets. So it's an easy way to to program them. So this is our vision of how we can get data, how we can manage all this data. And afterwards, we will see that depending on the applications, we have been applying all this uh, paradigm in a different way. So when we speak, oh, the initial idea was to make some teaching and afterwards execute it. But we found out that it's also viable and very nice to have these tools for, for using it for different kind of application that we will see afterwards. So, and the main tractor of all this development has been Sherlock project. Uh, you can see the, uh, the picture on, on the top where we have a mobile dual arm manipulation. And uh, here the in the use case, we have some big carbon fiber parts that we should be during the manufacturing of these parts and these parts travel from station to station to do a lot of different steps or production steps. And the operator spent a lot of time just moving these parts from one station to the other. So the idea was to, to include a mobile manipulator to make the teaching. 
And uh, there, uh, Sofitec, the end user, told us that uh, all these shelf, uh, all these stations were constantly evolving, moved. Uh, if some operator needed some space, uh, uh, he was moving the shelves uh, over and over again. So this traditional robot programming was not feasible. So in, in their mind, uh, the operator should be able to, to teach some trajectories in, in an easy way. So that's why we, we thought the first thought was to apply this uh, hand guiding. But we have some additional, let's say, not problems, but issues to solve because we have a dual arm manipulator here. So should we do the teaching twice or should we use just one arm, make some teaching and translate, let's say, the movements of one arm to the other? And there were a lot of quality of life issues that we should solve in order to make it viable to use this hand guiding uh, concept and ideas in 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 a mobile dual arm robot. So taking it uh, as a context, so we decided to to use uh, this idea of hand guiding and teaching. Here, uh, all the trajectories you will see in, in the video have been created using the teaching. We didn't put any numbers, programming, or so on. So here, uh, one of the things that we also used the force feedback of the arm to move the mobile manipulator. So we are able to move the platform using the force feedback. So it's something that we have not talked, and the initial idea is not was not this, but we saw that it's a nice addition. If we are guiding the, the arm, why not guide also the, the platform? So we develop some kind of skill of for moving a manipulator. And afterwards, uh, our colleague, or that's not here right now, Paul is making the teaching of with one arm, teaching how to grasp one of these uh, carbon fiber part. So you can see that very smoothly he's able to put the robot. And you will see him interacting with the um, tablet to to input that uh, this should be the grasping point. And afterwards, uh, in some parts, we are can also say that uh, some segment of the trajectory will be for hand guide, uh, co manipulation of the parts, and so on. So the idea here is to use just tablet to teach a trajectory and also able be able to par, uh, to mark in some way the parts that will be executed by the robot. Some parts of the trajectory will be uh, used for the co manipulation of parts. So here we, you can see the mobile platform going to the to the shelf. It will grasp the part, and all these trajectories has been uh, created uh, with the hand guiding and the teaching functionality you saw before. And we only make the um, the teaching of one of the arms, and afterwards we make the analysis and we make the the needed calculus to let's say translate from one arm to the other. So the idea is to, we should make it simple. So robot, uh, the user should not be spent, uh, should be not spending time teaching with two, the both arms. So we enhance, enhance this traditional teaching to, to afterwards and get all this information and make it easy or executable in, in the other arm. So here, uh, the mobile manipulation manipulator will take the part to the to the other station, and afterwards uh, we can also use this. Basically, these are the same, more or less the same technologies, but using these hand guiding technologies to co manipulate the part. So the idea is that we have made the teaching of which should be the theoretical way that the part should make or the arm. But in this co-manipulation, uh, an operator, in this case, it will be me, <laughs> but we will be able to uh, modify a bit. So the trajectory is taught and we will push in the part. We will be able to travel this trajectory. And additionally, we will be able to modify or deviate a bit from this theoretical trajectory. The idea is that here, it's not easy to make a teaching and to put it precisely in those uh, small fixtures. So 
the operator should be able to modify a bit this trajectory and use this force information that it's more or less this dump, uh, damper spring uh, system to, to put it precisely in, in the fixtures. So here afterwards, uh, we made also the teaching for the grasping of the big part. And as before, we only make the teaching one, with one of the arm. We don't care if in some cases it was easier for us to make it with the left arm and afterwards execute it with the right arm, the same one. In other cases, we did it in, in the inverse way. So here the idea is that all, everything that you are seeing uh, has been taught with the hand guidance, uh, hand guidance application. So everything is easy, easy to program and the operator should be able and in case something changes or the shelf uh, changes or we modify anything in the setup to make a, another teaching. So now it will release the part and we will skip to the to the other project where we face some other the application is completely different and we will talk about some issues that we found and how we enhance it this uh, hand guidance by the teleoperation. Okay, so now jumping to the to the remodel project. Here, the idea is that uh, we are using robot for the cable routing. That is a complex thing. So we cannot, we need, it's very important in the complete path that we are teaching to make a, a proper uh, cable routing. So here, it's very necessary to record all this data where we talked about uh, the recording trajectories at uh, 10 hertz and I'll ha have all this uh, amount of Cartesian trajectory information. But here we found that, that okay, do it in manually, it's nice, but uh, there were some parts of the table due to the configuration of, of the robots that the operator uh, was not able to access manually. So uh, we decided that, uh, as we talked before, there's teleoperation, that is a nice way to teach also things and make this uh, mixing of okay we will record we will record data both using hand guidance we will record data also uh, getting information about uh, the teleoperation and afterwards for the execution we will mix all this information because uh, at the end of the day uh, we have cartesian information about the path that is what we want so here uh, our colleague uh, Javier is taking the part. So it's making the initial part of the teaching manually. But uh, after some centimeters of making the teaching, he will not be able to reach further with, uh, with the robot. And now he's switching to the um, to the teleoperation. So he has this small 6D mouse and he's making the, the teaching. And we will mix, in this case, also the, the teaching, uh, making the teaching for the different ar uh, arms uh, of the system. We have, in this case, two arms for making the, the routine of uh, long references. So here the idea is that we are uh, mixing this uh, hand guidance with the teleoperation that as we talked before it's very convenient for some setups which are not very ergonomic or where we cannot access and we applied the same same concept of uh, of sherlock but mixing uh, the teaching of uh, two different arms mixing the hand guidance and and also the the teleoperation so uh, right now, depending on the uh, applications, uh, we are relying on the hard guidance or on or the use of this teleoperation with these six, six mouse.
Okay, so you can see that uh, we are making a more complex teaching uh, during the routing. Uh, a human or, or a robot should make some uh, small movements around these pins to ensure that the routing is, uh, is fulfilled uh, completely and the cable is, is tight. So in this case, it was really necessary to all use all this, the information recorded uh, during the teaching phase. In some other application, maybe the, all this information is not uh, very important, but in this case, finally, we make some segmentation of some down sampling and getting information of each two millimeters to ensure that we were reproducing the trajectories in a, in a precise way. So afterwards, uh, just another way of uh, seeing how we are applying uh, this uh, hand guidance. This is a Odin project where the application is completely different. So it's a, about screw fastening on, on a moving engine. So we have a, a engine cover that is moving in a conveyor belt. And with this uh, mobile platform, we are just in the force feedback and doing some visual surveying to, to screw uh, some, some bolts. It's a very precise operation. And we are doing without any previous information about the movement of, of the part. So uh, indeed, the application has nothing to similar with the previous one showed in, in Sherlock on, or Remodel. So it's not about teaching, but uh, we need to make the teaching or uh, provide the information to the visual surveying algorithm about the position of the different screws uh, in the cover and regarding the the marker and or the detection that we are seeing there. So in order to do so, we decided to use the, both even the hand guidance or the teleoperation to put the um, uh, the robot in the desired position, record the information about which is the relative position between the marker and and the screws, and that's a side thing that is not uh, really tightened to the, to the application, but here the application is about visual surveying and so on. But we found out that all this operation and hand guidance is very convenient to make this teaching and get meaningful information for, for the application. So it's a way of try, we do, what we try to do is to not think about the traditional teaching, but okay, this these uh, tools and this hand guidance can be used for further uh, application that is in, are not tightly related with the teaching itself, but uh, we always in all the application need to provide some information about relevant points, about uh, precise uh, positions of the robot to do different tasks. So this is a, another way of using this hand guidance. And finally, Okay, we have uh, also this teleoperation. It's a very, uh, some application we developed for the last uh, BM Fair in Bilbao. So here uh, it's about uh, let's say pure uh, teleoperation, but thinking on a completely different application. It's about inspection and maintenance task. Uh, in this case, we have this spot robot where we mounted on some arm and some uh, hand. We are teleoperating everything, but uh, it's, it's very interesting, this application of these technologies, uh, especially this thought about uh, making some inspection and maintenance in hazardous um, uh, areas, like can be radioactive uh, areas, some, some petrol uh, management stations where they have a lot of uh, dangerous uh, environments there. So here we have also used this um, teleoperation technologies to both uh, manipulate uh, the spot robot, also the arm and the, and the robotic arm. So maybe we are uh, going a bit uh, further from the initial idea of hand guiding, but let's say that all these uh, technologies we are expanding and using it in, in different applications because we saw that they are very convenient, uh, not only for the traditional teaching applications, but are interesting to apply in in this kind of, and for us, it's also interesting because we see that it's very convenient and easy to use or apply at least these technologies uh, to avoid for us uh, putting a lot of manual information on, 
on the applications. So now John will go to the conclusions part, if I'm correct. Mm, yes. Okay, so I take control of the screen. So thank you, Aitor, for all these very interesting explanations and illustrative projects. Uh, as you can see, we are involved in a wide range of different applications in, in Technalia, applying all these technologies to different needs of companies. And to wrap up the, uh, the webinar, well, let's uh, try to, to get some conclusions on the things that we have talked about. So uh, as we have seen, hand guiding and also teleoperations are very useful tools to try to adopt robotics in uh, areas where they haven't been applied yet. And so where are we going? What what do we see from Technalia uh, as the, the next steps in, in robotic applications in, in our surrounding and in our collaboration with companies? So we are seeing more and we are seeing more and more the the use of uh, robotic arms on top of mobile platforms as we have seen in the in the videos uh, and until now uh, with uh, the illustration that we have seen in the car manufacturing uh, plant uh, we are very used to seeing uh, robots industrial robots behind fences but uh, more and more we are going to see uh, more collaborative or smaller robotic arms that can move around in the shop floor uh, to have uh, higher flexibility and adaptability on our production means and this will also be a challenge because we have to make these installations collaborative we cannot uh, rebuild all the factories that are already producing goods but we have to make robots uh, share the space with uh, human human operators and these technologies can can help us achieve that right so we will see more and more collaborative installations and as i thought was mentioning uh, these collaborative robotic arms uh, started some years ago with very low payloads and now we are seeing higher payload collaborative robots that will help us introduce these technologies in more and more applications and we what we are seeing also is that with all the revolution of the artificial intelligence we will see these all these developments also shift towards uh different fields and robotics as you can imagine is uh, a very good candidate to apply all the advancements in artificial intelligence to to make these robots more autonomous and more adaptable to very uh, structured environments and we will see in the forthcoming years uh, these collaborative applications where we will uh, combine all these technologies and hand guiding will be one of the tools that we can use to interact with the robots but we will also see the and we are working on already at, uh, at Technalia uh, for example with the use of LLMs for large language models to interact in a natural way with robots to not only teach trajectories by hand guiding or teleoperations but uh, also communicating with the robot in a more natural way to develop an application a higher level application uh, with uh, all these technologies being able to to interact very in a very powerful way between a human operator and and a robotic system and um, well i've also added the uh, vision enabled robots uh, as you can imagine uh, in all these applications vision is also a very key part of the of the installation because you need to provide eyes to the robots so they can get also 
of this visual information and adapt the operations that they have to perform to the different parts and geometries that we have to handle. Uh, so, uh, as, as, uh, as roboticists, uh, we get this question a lot. Am I going to lose my job? Are the robots going to take out jobs? And what we have to, to be clear about is that uh, the countries that have higher levels of uh, robot density is the, are the countries that have lower unemployment. So we can think of Japan, Germany, Korea, uh, China. Uh, they are adopting all these technologies to make uh, their uh, industrial uh, sector more competitive and uh, go beyond uh, the production models that we have known uh, until now. So we have to see robotics as an opportunity to make our industry stronger. And uh, there are a lot of studies about, about this. And so it is true that uh, all this automatization revolution will change the type of jobs, but in a in a good way. So going from physical and dangerous tasks to more uh, uh, um, to less dangerous tasks where uh, operators will interact with very advanced technologies in a more natural way to, to improve the, the production rates of of the companies and it is true that this is going to be a challenge for our society and we have to uh, be very careful uh, as a society as a whole to to uh, make our uh, people more knowledgeable about all these uh, new skills that uh, are going to be required to use all these tools but from the very technological side of the uh, of this uh, history, we are trying to develop these technologies to, to make this uh, adoption smoother. Uh, so as a last slide to conclude, uh, I would say that we are going to see a paradigm, uh, paradigm shift uh, with all the technological advancements that we are seeing. And, Robotics are more and more present everywhere, uh, but there is still a lot of room for improvement. And I think that we are going to see uh, the adoption of robots, uh, some something similar that uh, we have seen with uh, mobile phones, right? Uh, before the years 2000, mobile phones were a very exotic thing. And 20 years later, everyone has a, a mobile phone but so robots uh, in a way uh, i think will be present uh, well especially in the manufacturing industry uh, more and more and all these technologies will help us uh, have uh, more natural uh, collaboration with with this technology right and it's uh, an opportunity, as I was saying. Uh, what we're seeing is that China and USA are uh, pushing a lot. China with uh, all the automatization. From the USA, we're seeing a lot of advancements in artificial intelligence. And well, the European Union is uh, also in the game. And we are not badly placed, but we, we have to be aware that uh, we have to to push uh, all these technologies to be to to keep being in the uh, head of the in the industrial world, and what we have seen today is uh, one of these technologies, uh, hand guiding, that will will help us uh, achieve these goals. So this is the the presentation that we we had we have prepared. Uh, I don't know. Now we have time for for questions. If anyone in the audience wants to ask something, I think we already had some, some questions. 
please uh, please use your chat in order to send us uh, if you have any question. I have one. Uh, I think uh, I thought you have uh, introduced the functionalities base functionalities that uh, different uh, uh, commercial robots offer in order to implement uh, this hand guidance. But I think uh, there is much more than uh, you need in order to implement and deploy this in a real application. Uh, so I guess it's possible to use uh, collaborative robots, but also other robots. Uh, how difficult it is uh, to, to use uh, non-collaborative robots or this uh, Functionalities, base functionalities make it more easy, or uh, uh, this technology is apply, applicable in, in, in any, any robot, collaborative or traditional ones? For the main issue, I would say that uh, this implementation of the hand guidance in an industrial robot is not an easy thing. In certain ways, in this case of the Fanuc, they have a um, this tool that it's on the shelf. Uh, you can take a um, buy and use it. But uh, to implement it by yourself, it's uh, it can be quite tricky. Taking into account uh, that uh, you can buy a force torque sensor and make all the calculations and so on, to have this low level access to the industrial robots uh, is not something. Until now, at least, uh, mainly all the manufacturers are closing uh, this gate of low-level control. Now they are becoming more and more open to to this. But uh, I would say that uh, one of the big issues is the uh, one of the big issues is the uh, use of this. Uh, of this hand guidance is the, the main challenge initially. Afterwards, all recording all this data and use it afterwards for, for anything, it's a common thing that it's not a big issue. I mean, or, or at least it's common for, for the different kind of robots and could be a, a, a common development. But uh, introducing this hand guidance uh, to industrial robots is not a, an easy thing, I, I would say. Eh? Uh, we can do it, but it's uh, there are some penalizations to of ha not having this low level access. And for sure, I guess there are also safety issues that are yeah, more yeah, important yeah, sure. to take into account. Yeah. Yeah. Also, also safety goes uh, in the collaborative robots. Everything is uh, built in and it's uh, on itself. But here also, if, when we are talking about the uh, huge robots and people around it, uh, in automatic mode, it's, uh, it's a big issue. And aside from the technology itself, you should uh, include different mechanisms to, to ensure that safety that, every, every, that all the time, for example, the uh, operator is pushing the death man button, button or something like this, but it's something that you should do it by yourself, certificate, and it's not a, a trivial query. Uh, okay, and uh, perhaps, uh, okay, we have seen uh, some solutions with uh, dual arm robots that perhaps are, um, okay, more expensive to be deployed in uh, uh, in a uh, industrial uh, application, is this uh, technology also suitable for for being used with just one arm, and uh, to have uh, the operator come manipulating the the part and one on, only one arm uh, for having uh, interesting applications or effective applications? Yeah, for sure. Uh... Indeed, having this uh, dual arm setup makes things <laughs> more more complex. No? But uh, traditionally, we can think of uh, this hand guidance as a way of moving around in a simple way, and also as as we saw in in the case, uh, it's a similar thing. But this uh, co manipulation of parts is also also an interesting thing, or at least uh, if we have heavy loads to let the robot have 
the the main weight of of the part and the operator in a simple way or without any effort can place the parts and and so on but yeah, i think that in our case this dual configuration that what we have shown maybe it uh, it not makes more sense but it helps a lot because it, it's more complex to to do things manually and so on so it's a nice tool but it's still there's a lot of room to for this hand guiding and teaching or co manipulation technologies for using just one one arm and indeed it will be more intuitive and i also have in mind that when using it's still not very very popular and not uh, so much used so we should use it with one arm to see which are the limits which are the the problems of using it which uh, and it will evolve naturally because uh, the more people the uses these technologies we will see which are the real needs of industry and it will evolve in our case the dual arm configuration and so on i think that is very specific uh, still a very specific uh, application field yeah and final uh, um, question or or information from my side uh, i think we have seen in your uh, presentation that uh, from the basic technology offered by the robot uh, providers or commercial robots we have been uh, applying this technology and we have been evolving and introducing, uh, adding new functionalities, uh, mixing different technologies in order to uh, uh, provide uh, solutions in different applications. I think it's uh, still a lot of to, to discover and a lot of things to be uh, okay implemented in order to uh, use in uh, novel applications. So I guess uh, we need uh, a lot of support from uh, end users and from uh, integrators or engineering companies that could uh, bring uh, new problems uh, where this technology could be applied. So I invite uh, all the people in the audience uh, that could have uh, problems or uh, challenges where this technology could be used and we could uh, try to, to uh, okay, to check if, uh, uh, this technology could be of uh, interest. Yeah, uh, inside uh, Penelope, there is a uh, early adopters program that is uh, open now. Uh, it will close at the end of month, and uh, it's uh, offering uh, external companies of the project uh, the possibility to to uh, check and validate uh, different technologies that we are offering. From Penelope, there is a catalog. I invite you to check uh, in the Penelope uh, web uh, page. There is a lot of information about the technologies offered by the different uh, partners in the project. I think there are more than 20 technologies. And uh, we could offer some services in order to evaluate uh, these technologies uh, free. So I invite you to, to check and apply and uh, okay, collaborate with us. Uh, uh, to uh, okay to, to to exploit the technologies we have developed in this project uh, in the real industrial scenarios and final comments from my side uh, for those that uh, are interested in uh, knowing more about uh, the robotics activities of technalia uh, i put in the chat uh, several links of uh, some uh, short uh, videos summarizing the activities in the last uh, years from I think it's 2021 until 2023. I think there are, uh, uh, or 2020, uh, 2023, uh, four videos, uh, different years, uh, summarizing our activities in robotics. I think it's a very interesting, uh, okay, material. Uh, in short time, you could uh, get uh, uh, a lot of uh, information regarding our activities in robotics. So I think it's uh, interesting for you. If there is uh, some final question from your side, uh, we could uh, answer. If not, I think it's uh, okay. Time to close. So, someone is uh, final question. Okay. So, thank you very much for attending this uh, webinar on hand guiding technology supported by a Penelope project. And uh, okay, if you have uh, in the future some uh, 
problem, some request, some challenge uh, you want to solve uh, in an industrial setting, in manufacturing, by the use of robots in general, or this hand guiding technology in particular, please uh, contact us and we will try to help you. Thank you for attending and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye.